Part 1, Chapter 1 of Jezebel's Daughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jezebel's Daughter by Wilkie Collins. Part 1, Chapter 1. In the matter of Jezebel's Daughter, my recollections begin with the deaths of two foreign gentlemen in two different countries on the same day of the same year. They were both men of some importance in their way, and both strangers to each other. Mr. Ephraim Wagner, merchant, formerly of Frankfurt on the Main, died in London on the third day of September, 1828. Dr. Fontaine, famous in his time for discoveries in experimental chemistry, died at Wurzburg on the third day of September, 1828. Both the merchant and the doctor left widows. The merchant's widow, an Englishwoman, was childless. The doctor's widow, of a South German family, had a daughter to console her. At that distant time, I am writing these lines in the year 1878, and looking back through half a century, I was a lad employed in Mr. Wagner's office. Being his wife's nephew, he most kindly received me as a member of his household. What I am now about to relate I saw with my own eyes, and heard with my own ears. My memory is to be depended on. Like other old men, I recollect events which happened at the beginning of my career far more clearly than events which happened only two or three years since. Good Mr. Wagner had been ailing for many months, but the doctors had no immediate fear of his death. He proved the doctors to be mistaken, and took the liberty of dying at a time when they all declared that there was every reasonable hope of his recovery. When this affliction fell upon his wife, I was absent from the office in London on a business errand to our branch establishment at Frankfurt on the Main, directed by Mr. Wagner's partners. The day of my return happened to be the day after the funeral. It was also the occasion chosen for the reading of the will. Mr. Wagner, I should add, had been a naturalized British citizen, and his will was drawn by an English lawyer. The fourth, fifth, and sixth clauses of the will are the only portions of the document which it is necessary to mention in this place. The fourth clause left the whole of the testator's property, in lands and in money, absolutely to his widow. In the fifth clause he added a new proof of his implicit confidence in her. He appointed her sole executrix of his will. The sixth and last clause began in these words. During my long illness my dear wife has acted as my secretary and representative. She has made herself so thoroughly well acquainted with the system on which I have conducted my business that she is the fittest person to succeed me. I not only prove the fullness of my trust in her, and the sincerity of my gratitude towards her, but I really act in the best interests of the firm of which I am the head, when I hereby appoint my widow as my sole successor in the business, with all the powers and privileges appertaining thereto. The lawyer and I both looked at my aunt. She had sunk back in her chair. Her face was hidden in her handkerchief. We waited respectfully until she might be sufficiently recovered to communicate her wishes to us. The expression of her husband's love and respect, contained in the last words of the will, had completely overwhelmed her. It was only after she had been relieved by a burst of tears that she was conscious of our presence, and was composed enough to speak to us. "'I shall be calmer in a few days' time,' she said. "'Come to me at the end of the week. I have something important to say to both of you.' The lawyer ventured on putting a question. "'Does it relate in any way to the will?' he inquired. She shook her head. "'It relates,' she answered, to my husband's last wishes. She bowed to us and went away to her own room. The lawyer looked after her gravely and doubtfully as she disappeared. "'My long experience in my profession,' he said, turning to me, "'has taught me many useful lessons. Your aunt has just called one of those lessons to my mind. "'May I ask what it is, sir?' "'Certainly.' He took my arm and waited to repeat the lesson until we had left the house. Always distrust a man's last wishes on his deathbed, unless they are communicated to his lawyer and expressed in his will. At the time I thought this rather a narrow view to take. How could I foresee that coming events in the future life of my aunt would prove the lawyer to be right? If she had only been content to leave her husband's plans and projects where he had left them at his death, and if she had never taken that rash journey to our branch office at Frankfurt, but what is the use of speculating on what might or might not have happened? My business in these pages is to describe what did happen. Let me return to my business. End of chapter 1 of part 1